So welcome guys, uh, thanks very much for being on the channel, Gallery of Guitar, and it's a big welcome to Lenny Ronaldo, electric guitarist and classical guitarist, and Jan Foot, a composer who's with us today. And we're going to talk about a completely new work written for electric guitar um, called Engine Room, which Lenny uh, performed earlier this year and made a fantastic video of, which you'll see right at the end of this interview. But first of all, to sort of talk about the piece, I think we'll go to Jan and ask him um, just to explain uh, the writing of the piece and the idea behind it. Um, yeah, the, so um, my original idea for the piece was I wanted to write one that went through a series of different scoratura while playing the piece. Um, so I thought to myself that I wanted to have essentially six, I think it's six sections, and that the piece would basically um, tune down, essentially. So it starts kind of above what standard tuning would be on the guitar and kind of tunes down from like an F, like an open F, which is a bit weird. And it goes down in like steps, and, uh, in half steps to, to an open C-ish tuning. Okay, um, as well so, as that. So just so, just, I know I'm sorry I'm cutting in, but just so people get... You're starting off and you're moving pitch the whole way through the piece. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's in constant, constant flux, the tuning. Uh, yeah. So um, pretty much all of the phrases are based around ways that Lenny could actually retune a string uh, in a practical way. Okay. Wow. Um, so for example, he would play a phrase and then I came, I thought to myself and then asked Lenny about this as well, how... Um, like if there's a, if there was a pitch which was the same, so because the whole piece is in harmonics and open strings. Okay. So yeah. I was always looking for a place on a different string where you would get the same resultant pitch. That was the first place to start. Ah, okay. So that's sort of like almost like a landmark that you can then have as you go through. Uh, how Lenny? How did have you played anything like this before? No, I've never played <laughs> anything that was so active in the in. The use of the tuning pegs, okay. Obviously, so uh, there's I played some other works as well with where you're uh, moving between pitches, maybe with a whammy bar or bending a note, you know, in, yeah. in a uh, more conventional fashion, yeah. right? But uh, this piece, essentially, uh, it was the most um, maybe difficult, let's say, or, or most complete in its use of okay. the tuning pegs as a uh, a constant playing technique. Okay. Okay. And what's the duration of the piece, Jan? How 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 long are we talking that this this effect is obviously sort of going on for? It's about seven and a half minutes, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, eight eight minutes somewhere. Yeah. Somewhere yeah. between seven and eight minutes. Okay. Cool. Wow. That's amazing. I mean, it's a hard hard to remember where you are and stuff, and like you know, keep keep the 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 the, the direction through the work. It's it's really challenging for both uh, of you, I think. <laughs> um. Yeah. I think for Lenny, I find it incredible. I My original idea was that he would um, perform it in bits because I didn't think it was really possible to play the entire thing through in one go okay. without something going wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in the end, he, he did a great job of going from start to finish, really, yeah. um, and actually playing the piece through, which I was kind of astounded by when I saw the video the first time. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I mean, that's yeah. one take, right? Yeah, just so that the viewers know as well, yeah, it, it is a one take. Yeah. And we didn't do any fancy movie magic or anything. That's, that's incredible. Just, that is the piece, yeah. as it would be if you were to come to a concert or something. I think I remember when you were starting to work on the piece that you said, yeah, I don't know if <laughs> you could play it live. I think you were, I think that was one of the first comments because, you know, we were working on the piece yeah. and I was sort of saying, okay, so what's going on with this piece? You know, the tuning piece, you t talking about it to me. And then you were sort of saying, I don't know if it would be something I could, you know, less silly, like go and program in a, in a gig because, yeah. you know, like Jan was saying, if something goes wrong, you can't really, I mean, could you, you can't really rehearse the piece in sections at all, can you? Well, yeah, that was an issue I, I ran into early on. And uh, yeah, Jan and I kind of talked about that in the in the latter process. But uh, what I eventually did was, you know, there there's are signposts in the piece. Yeah. Uh, so maybe about six uh, points where you're just kind of playing the open tuning just okay. to get that into the listener's ear as well. And so it's sort of a, not really a stopping point, but somewhere where you can be like, you can almost check, yeah. but there is no time to correct it if you didn't make it to the right place okay. at the right okay. time. I've got you. I've got you. So essentially it's a one shot deal. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. It's nice. It's nice. Um, okay. So, so yeah. So you said it starts in a sort of F tuning 
and gets itself down to C. Is that right? Very loosely, yes. Okay. Um, Very loosely so the, as well. <laughs> okay. Um, none of them would be called the standard open tuning, I don't think. Um, I think it's the E string which is consistent. The, yeah, the low E string consistently goes down from an F to a C, and the yeah. rest of the strings um, go up and down a bit more. But with like a general downward trend towards... Okay. Um, yeah, and at the end of the piece, I wanted the idea was I wanted all the strings to be a C, so I have like a. I think it's Lou Lou Reed did something similar, didn't he? With yeah, his or ter tunings. Terry Terry Riley and stuff like that, didn't right. they? All yeah. this idea of C. Yeah. yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, well, very early um, when when Lou Reed was yeah first collaborating with you know, John Cale, who was a yeah you know avant garde violist at one point, <laughs> an avant garde violist. Yeah, <laughs> they. Uh, he, he wrote one of these pieces that was, yeah, he called it the ostrich tuning, okay. which everything was one. I don't know if it was C, I can't remember, but everything, yeah. all the strings of the guitar were the same pitch. Okay. <laughs> so Okay, but in different octaves or uh, literally the same pitch? I can't remember, but okay. it's a, you have to have a specific yeah. guitar you have yeah, to have yeah, yeah. for yeah. that. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, the sound is amazing. I think people will, um, you know, they'll see you holding an electric guitar, but they won't necessarily, you know, associate the sound coming out with standard electric guitar classical contemporary piece let's say um you know people think of obviously like steve reich and the electric counterpoint and you know you, you play martin feldman and some other pieces yeah, yeah. for electric guitar but this is this actually it does sound really i mean i can't say it sounds completely unique because i haven't heard every electric guitar yeah. piece ever written but like to me it has this really fresh sort of sound and it takes me back as well to sort of sort of in a sense exploring electric guitar as a classical player like you know having these maybe slightly more um eccentric ideas you know which i think playing a classical instrument we all kind of explore those anyway sure. but you know um i think people will en enjoy that because they'll sort of hear the electric guitar in a very different uh in a different way to what they're what they're used to for sure um so then jan like how did you notate these things for lenny like so he knew all this detuning was happening how did you actually annotate it for him that was a back and forth process between uh, Lenny and me. Uh, I'm a very bad guitar player myself. <laughs> and I'm talking like I'm nothing to brag about at all. <laughs> but uh, I can play open strings. Yeah. <laughs> so so I can just I can figure out the tunings that way. Um, yeah. So I think the first thing that happened is I kind of played through... Uh, parts of the of the piece because in my head the piece is structured in sections and Lenny yeah. mentioned before these signposts of yeah. like where you've got a bit of time to just check everything so I essentially compose a piece from one signpost to the next one uh, okay yeah and then played through them I actually made a mock-up which took me I think about 130 takes <laughs> to get through the piece wow um yeah it didn't go it didn't yeah. go well it was really one phrase at a time Mm -hmm. And then I could listen back and I could kind of transcribe what I'd written. Okay. And then it was really very much about the strings. It wasn't about um, the notes so much anymore. So that, and that was one of Lenny's ideas was to just not actually have a sound, a resultant, um, a fingered, a fingered part of the score, because sometimes in scoratura pieces for the electric guitar, you have like a sounding and a yeah. fingered um, yeah. like a regular yeah, tuned yeah. way of playing yeah and that felt like it was too much information because mm -hmm. and it didn't really make that much difference what was mm -hmm. important is knowing that you're playing which string you're playing because they're all either open strings or harmonics okay and the yeah. other thing is which harmonic you're playing <laughs> so right. i could play through phrases write down which harmonic i was playing on which string what that mm -hmm. resultant pitch was and i could kind of jot it all down so that I knew what was going on. And then I sent it to Lenny and he told me the things which worked and which didn't work. And if somebody else was to look at the piece, how, mm -hmm. how they would receive it as well. So it was really important to have his feedback in that. Yeah, that must be, I mean, that must be integral for like, if it's not just going to be Lenny that plays it in the future, if it, if it you know, because obviously you want people to pick the piece up and, and 
you sort of have together produced a score that people can work from and you know they could maybe obviously reach out to you in the future but like they could take it off the rack sort of thing and and play it yeah, yeah. And, and that was kind of the idea or that's what i was always keeping in mind when when you know jan was bouncing ideas off of me for how to notate it yeah. is that if i mean also just for me yeah. in terms of the simplicity and, and cleanliness of the score you know just having mm -hmm. the most important information mm -hmm. right in front of you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um it's so, interesting Jan mentioned the idea of like not writing a you know this is the real pitch and this is the fingered score a bit like you know we have this yeah. we have a really famous piece in the guitar literature Jan called Koyambaba by a Turkish composer Carlo Domeniconi mm -hmm. and um, it is, it's that you, you, you literally play it in standard tuning in terms of reading and then you have the, the score at pitch of what comes out you yeah. know but it's probably even more complex to do something like that with this work well because yeah and I don't uh, we had discussed that, and I think that was one of Jan's early ideas uh, and on how to notate it, okay. which is, you know, not terribly uncommon. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Uh, the problem, or the problem that arose, right, is that you're never in Koyambaba is in one tuning. Yeah, always. It's yeah. Always in one yeah, tuning. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. this is like we're yeah. in one tuning, kind of for two measures, and then yeah. one string changes, and then yeah, yeah. <laughs> so a new scottura finger tuning every six sound yeah, posts. I mean, it's crazy. So yeah, you have no, mad, yeah. uh, you have no real um, uh, point of reference mm -hmm. in terms of the fingered note plus the pitch that comes out. Yeah, uh, because the the strings are always in flux from. Okay. Basically, yeah, probably measure two or three. It's like already, yeah, <laughs> it's already new. That's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, some in, in guitar concerts, Jan, like when you go to see people play, you know, maybe in the saraband of a back suite, there'll be a detuning of one string. Do you know what I mean? You know, just to, just to allow you to get to like the relative minor or major or whatever's going on in the suite. You know, um, so people will just be like, "What are you doing? Stop moving those tuning pegs! You're making me nervous!" Yeah. Like, you know, people well, be freaking I was, out. I was very nervous throughout, as you rem <laughs> probably remember. Yeah, I thought you looked pretty cool actually. I was yeah. kind of amazed. I mean, it is literally just. Uh, it's also, I don't know if, Jan, you felt like this, but watching it, because I was there when it was recorded, and it's really interesting because after about a minute or two, your preconceptions or whatever they are about a tuning really change quickly. You get into a really sort of like, it's not hypnotic, that's too easy language, but like I was really drawn in by this constantly in flux. And again, that's another word I use. I don't know if it's the correct one, but... Um, were you sort of was that something you were aiming for in this like you know uh yeah completely mm -hmm. um i don't i don't love the idea of things being an equal temperament but i'm also i mean there's a big section of people in the contemporary classical music world who really like just intonation and micro tonality yeah and i'm very much not part of that either mm -hmm. um but i really like because uh, it's too specific in that case for me personally it's too specific and i just like the out of tuneness of things yeah mm -hmm. um and it's funny i think even from when i because i played guitar when i was really young and i just i can't quite like things being out of tune mm -hmm. yeah so yeah. we have this we had we had a discussion with this about this at the beginning like it's never going to lenny mentioned it would never be in tune yeah really and i or i think my response to that was i don't care if it's not in tune I just care that there's not so much out of tune that it becomes jarring. Yeah. So it just needs to be close enough. Yeah. Um, so I think if it really gets, if it's less than a quarter tone, then we're just about okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so trigger warning to all the perfect pitch listeners. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Proceed with caution. Okay, you mean all the 1980s <laughs> metalhead electric guitar players that, you know, like after the 1980s well, stopped. <laughs> people it was kind of cool to not tune your guitar anymore yeah, yeah. it's like nirvana came along and it's like all right okay everything's gonna be all right you know um okay is it no but it's it, it, it that's what i think i meant it's like if you were listening to a baroque ensemble say playing at you know a much lower pitch than 440 hertz you know our accepted a your ear does take a minute or so to adjust you know and you might you might feel a little bit like oh things are really out of tune because it's not a piano and it's not hugely tempered you know but after i think most people's ears just adjust you know and i think people listening to it they'll by you know not very long into the piece they'll sort of start to realize that this is this is very natural it's very organic these relationships between frequencies you know it's like it's just really natural to listen to music like that so Jan, when you were when you were actually uh writing the piece apart from the scogitura and all the tuning and things like that um 
was there any influences there? Was was there anything influencing the? I'm sure things influence you all the time, of course, when you're writing. But anything specific about this work? Oh yeah, I mean, there's there's always going to be some kind of external influence when you're writing a piece. Um, I've been writing quite a lot for electric guitar at the moment. It's an instrument that I come back to quite frequently since I was studying the Hague and the, loved the electric guitar there. Um, so I've been writing, I wrote a piece of two electric guitars quite recently called Refractions, which uses uh, Scordatura as well and almost exclusively harmonics doing a similar thing. So I kind of carried the ideas that I liked from that piece over to this piece. But as well as that, um, there was a piece by an old teacher of mine, Peter Adrian's, called Environments. And in those pieces, he restrings um, a classical guitar. So he's got six of, I think, more or less the same string. And then he retrains them all to, in that piece, I think it's a B. And then he's just doing patterns, rhythmic, rhythmic patterns on all of the strings of the electric guitar, but all the different, because they're slightly, maybe slightly differently tuned, or the thickness of the string, or the density of the string is different. So you get these different kind of timbral changes. Mm in the piece. And then there's also a piece called Until by Clarence Barlow, um, which I saw on YouTube relatively recently. And in that piece, he doesn't retune so much, I don't think. But if I'm not mistaken, the the guitars microtonally tuned, and then he has sine waves playing, which are constantly shifting at the same time. And that, and uh, the guitarist then repeats, repeats their uh, patterns. Okay. And then the interaction between the diff changing sign tones and the and the guitarist's performance ch- changes your perception of what the guitarist is actually playing as well. So those are the big ones. That's wow. That's what you're going to be doing next, Lenny. You yeah. do realise this, you know. That actually, you're going to be. It's going to be you and the sine waves and the guitar. So I mean, that that obviously was by a previous teacher, and that was written for classical guitar. Have you have you written anything for classical guitar, Jan, or has it just been for electric so far? Uh, I'm I'm scared of I'm scared of writing for classical guitar. Um, it's, we're, we're scared of playing it. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's difficult. I'm, I'm whenever I try to compose a piece of music, I try not to just do what's idiomatic. Even if that's sometimes what happens, I try to have a really strong idea about what I want to hear, and then try to execute that. And uh, I've played classical guitar a bit uh, myself. And so I kind of know what classical guitar sounds like, especially romantic classical guitar. Mm-hmm. And it worries me that I'm just going to fall into kind of copying what everybody else has already done for the yeah. instrument. And that's something which I really, I mean, I'd love to compose a good piece for classical guitar, but yeah. I'm not I'm not sure what that piece would be yet. And I'd need to really come up with a good idea to, oh. to, to go ahead with it. Well, I think this part of the collaborative process will help you. I mean, working with Lenny. Um, I'm signing you up for a new piece. Yeah, I know, a couple. <laughs> no, <laughs> hope that's okay, but um, I think that's probably the key, is work, working with a player, um, and, and a player that knows your music as well, um, will really help. I was thinking about it there as you were talking, some of the some really well-established uh, contemporary composers struggle with writing for, for classical guitar, and they're very vocal about it. They're not, they're not sort of pretending, you know, and there's been some pieces that, even if you think of like Viola Lobos, we, you know, we've been talking about this before, you get... He gets a chord, a shape, and then actually harmonically, he's just shifting the same fingering all over the all over the guitar. And then sometimes you get composers that maybe don't inherently know the guitar that well doing the same thing, and it can sound really kitsch or really pastiche kind of yeah. thing, you know. So I can see the I can see the fear or the reticence because it's so idiomatic, and those bottom three strings are a killer, D, A, and E, and you know, ninety nine percent of the guitar repertoire ended up in those three keys. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think uh, I think you could uh, you could definitely collaborate together a bit further and come up with something for for classical as well. Yeah, I think that there's a, a well a well worn path for uh, new pieces for classical guitar mm-hmm. as well. And uh, you know, extended techniques are always something that is mm-hmm. it can be very uh, fresh sounding yeah. in a certain way. And um, what I also you know maybe Jan and other any other composers that are watching this, um, there's also the possibility of doing live processing of classical guitar as well okay. with uh, added electronics which kind of can expand the palette as well or yeah. classical guitar in a uh, chamber context can mm-hmm. also give you a much wider palette mm-hmm. so maybe if it's not only the classical guitar yeah as well yeah yeah, yeah. that's a very um, good point yeah yeah it's kind of um 
you know, Boulez, you know, guitar appears in quite a lot of his pieces and yeah. the, the instrumentation is really quite, quite like very non-traditional, you yeah. know, anyway, um, with guitar involved in it as well. Yeah. Um, but it does, it's funny because you often don't think of the timbre of classical guitar, that sound as being after a duo with like, say, violin or flute or voice after that. And you start to add, you know, reed instruments, wind instruments, string instruments, guitar can get really, really lost. But I think mm -hmm. you're exploring something here whereby you could you could treat the, the classical sound a little bit as well with some amplification or you could do something quite interesting with it and then yeah. it would hold its own in those sort of ensembles you know and and even still you know i think that some people may bristle at that suggestion yeah and say you know why not just use an electric guitar at that point but yeah. there's uh, an amplified classical guitar i think we can all agree that it does not sound the same as an electric guitar no matter no. what you do <laughs> yeah. as well yeah yeah. Um, yeah but something else i would also encourage composers other composers to do is kind of lean into um we, we have lots of extraneous sounds that uh, that as classical guitarists in the um, traditional way we're trying to always get rid of buzzes and squeaks and all these things yeah. that when contextualized properly could be quite an interesting sound absolutely yeah um, but you know obviously in a yeah. in a traditional sense yeah. those are something those are unwanted sounds mm -hmm. but there's mm -hmm when done properly yeah it's it funny in, in the classical world they're yeah. unwanted sounds but like whenever I've worked with like singer songwriters and you know, they want some you know say a bit of classical guitar on their recording yeah. they want that left in because that's to them it's intrinsic it's like that's that then we know you're playing a classical guitar and yeah. I'm going God, I've spent my life trying to get rid of that like you sure. know but I mean I think uh, about it like the, the harpsichord as well like sometimes you can when at the end of a harpsichord piece right you can hear all the Kind of plectrums come back and hit the yeah. rest back on the strings and i love that sound i yeah. think it's great you know yeah. you hear the wood of it you can really yeah. hear the the how the sound is being produced mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i think that that's definitely a valid consideration mm -hmm. when you're thinking about a piece of music yeah of course yeah absolutely um well gentlemen i think we've come towards the end and i think people are sort of desperate to hear engine room and, and listen to the piece um i think they'll you know it opens with such you know space and it's quite a sparse opening but as lenny sort of described it's you know, a few measures in, the tuning's already drifted and everything's already starting to probably take people by surprise and, you know, um, it'll take them away from what their, you know, standard idea of the intonation and pitch and tuning is. And then it gets really quite rhythmic, as I think Jan was mentioning, you know, and, and then progresses through. And it's about eight minutes and it's a fantastic eight minutes, um, in my opinion. So I'm encouraging all the listeners to go and check out Engine Room. And gentlemen, thank you so much for being on the gallery and sharing your thoughts about this new work thanks yeah thanks very much matthew and congratulations to jan for a very successful yeah. piece yeah great job well done thank you very much <laughs>